Mike Lake. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> well, my name is Mike Lake, and I'm running to be your next lieutenant governor. And as I tell people across the Commonwealth, for me, it's not running to, to fill an office. It's running to make a difference, to make a difference in the lives of the people that you and I care most about. It's about our friends, our family, and our neighbors. It's about the community that we live in. See, when I was just five years old, my father passed away suddenly, at the age of 36. My mother became a single mom overnight. And it was because of our community, because of our, our safety net, and because of public education that I have been able to achieve and experience so many wonderful uh, things in my life. I've had the opportunity, as you just heard, to be appointed by President Clinton to serve at the United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley and to now be the President and CEO of an international organization called Leading Cities that focuses on uh, building partnerships with cities around the world to identify and exchange best practices to municipal challenges, exchanging those solutions so that all of our cities can better prepare for the 21st century. It's about creating business development opportunities so that we can strengthen our economies and create uh, jobs that pay a livable wage for our residents. And it's about, as you heard, creating government-to-government -government cooperation so that Massachusetts doesn't just operate in a global economy, but that we fully compete in that global arena. That we can, in fact, sell all the assets that we have and things that we should be proud of. Number one among them is our broad and deep talent base. We have almost an unparalleled talent base of any place on the planet, and yet we're not actively selling that in the global arena. We're not attracting all the businesses and investment, and most importantly, the jobs that pay a livable wage that they bring. When we do that, when we do that, we expand the job opportunities here in the Commonwealth. We put our unemployed back to work. We create opportunities for our recent graduates. They re we retain them. They stay here in the Commonwealth. Expanding our talent force, workforce becomes a stronger magnet, attracting more businesses with more investment. We expand our economic pie, increasing our revenues so that we can invest in the things that you and I care most about, education, infrastructure, and the like. You see, I believe we need an education system that's a pipeline of education that starts at early childhood education, recognizing that children, as we now know, are our best predictor for those, their children, those children's success is how prepared they are when they enter school, understanding numbers. It's simple. We also know that their reading ability by the third grade is the greatest predictor of their success in school specifically. Yet we're not investing early enough. We have an opportunity to do that. There is many states in the, in the country that are doing just that. Massachusetts can be among them, but we can't stop there. We have to continue to make sure that there are, pi there are education opportunities throughout the pipeline for vocational school and people later in life who have lost their jobs and need a little skills retraining so that we can leverage their experience. And so they have opportunities in the 21st century. I believe that we need to strengthen our economy by, by being competitive in the 21st century. And that starts with a strong education system right here in the Commonwealth. Thank you very much. So I think this happens to be the biggest issue we are facing, not just in Massachusetts, but in our country. Um, you know, I, I campaign on what I call the Massachusetts promise. The promise of economic and social justice through high quality education, safe communities, and jobs that pay a livable wage. You see, I think the first thing in terms of policy that we need to tackle in Massachusetts is creating a progressive tax system. We have a regressive tax system. In fact, the, the lowest income earners among us pay about 10 cents on every dollar in state and local taxes. The wealthiest 1% Massachusetts residents pay less than half of that on every dollar. That's a regressive tax system. And we have to do something about it because what we're doing is we're creating a system that people can't climb out of, a hole in which they're trapped. So that, to me, is the first issue. The second thing is about economic empowerment. You see, out of, when you add up all of the, the revenues of every business in Massachusetts, 1%, 1% of that revenue goes to businesses that are owned by minorities. We have to empower all of our citizens. We have to give them all an opportunity. Small businesses 
In fact, the Kauffman Foundation, number one foundation for entrepreneurship, did a study. They went back to 1977, and they looked at net new job creation in America. And do you know, since 1977, not one net new job was created by a business more than a year old. We have to empower our citizens. If we're going to talk about creating jobs, we have to empower them to be able to start their own businesses. And that we can do right here in the inner city. We need to empower all people equally. So to me, in summary, the two legislative things I would do is one, look at a, a constitutional amendment so that we can create a progressive tax system in Massachusetts. And number two, it's about empowering every resident so that they have access to capital and opportunity to start their businesses and to climb out of that hole that we've created. As you noted, the lieutenant governor does not have any particular authority over this, but it does highlight the opportunity for the lieutenant governor to be a liaison with our legislators, both at the state and national level. Our, our Washington congressional delegation um, is where we can really have an influence in that. So building that relationship between the governor's office and our um, congressional delegation, I think is, is probably the best way the lieutenant governor can have a direct impact on this. But there are two other op uh, issues here. Number one is being more vocal. I mean, one of the things that the lieutenant governor does have is a pulpit in which to be an advocate. And, I mean, you mentioned the Iraq war. I, I can, what's that? Did you, did you mention the Iraq war? Oh, uh, what did you say? Which war? Oh, Afghanistan, sorry. Uh, yes, I, I thought you said your husband had served. Um, uh, Afghanistan, sorry. So, in Afghanistan. So there was an opportunity for us to, to work with our delegation back then. Um, it's, like I said, it's not a role for the lieutenant governor. One thing that the lieutenant governor can do uh, is be an advocate and work with the governor on what happens with our members of the National Guard and our armed forces when they do come back. And I think that's a critical piece. Um, making sure that we have services for our veterans, that we have benefits for our veterans, recognizing the sacrifice they have made. Um, it's, well, recently I, I toured the Chelsea Soldiers Home. And we're fortunate to have the Chelsea Soldier Home, but quite frankly, it's in total disrepair. It needs a tremendous amount of investment to make sure that those who have, have sacrificed so much on behalf of all of us get the services and treatment and comfort that they deserve. Um, if you haven't gone up there, they're willing to show, to take people around and tour it. It's an it's a incredible experience to see. Um, one I wish I could be more proud of, um, to say that our veterans are being ter uh, treated with the best care possible. But quite frankly, it's an outdated facility. And we need to invest in that, Make sh making sure that our veterans, not only when they come back, have the health care they need, but they have educational opportunities, they have work opportunities, they have housing opportunities, so that they can sustain a, a lifestyle that they should have as people who have sacrificed on our behalf. Absolutely. This is actually one of the models that we have looked at uh, just recently. Um, Leading Cities is working on an entrepreneurship ecosystem strategy. Uh, so we're just launching it. Um, we have a summit in June to kind of coalesce around some of the early ideas. Um, but it's the heart of why we chose this topic is, as I mentioned, recognizing that this is the impetus for economic growth and job creation and opportunity. Um, I think there are many models, as you mentioned some, that we can be um, creating right here in, in Massachusetts. And it's key to the success of our gateway cities, Boston included. Um, as I mentioned, with, with so many, um, uh, such a disparity, let me put it this way, in business creation between um, minorities and the rest, that there's a fundamental problem that we need to address. And part of that is making it that first step a little bit easier, making sure that we have uh, opportunities like the cooperatives uh, that allow for that risk um, uh, alleviation. So I think that uh, if we can, in fact, uh, create these models, encourage people uh, to take advantage of it. And part of that is building awareness around it. Uh, we can't forget that part. Too many programs that we do build don't have the awareness structure to keep people informed of the opportunities that are there. Um, I think that has to be uh, started right from the beginning, that we can, in fact, make a, a huge difference in the lives of people who have great ideas and who can put those ideas and, and their work ethic to, 
to good use and to employ other people to strengthen their community uh, and to, frankly, increase the, the productivity right here in Massachusetts? Mm. Thank you. This is a great question. I, I actually recently also toured uh, the Suffolk County Correctional Facility. And Sheriff Tompkins is doing a great job. He has instituted some programs around voca vocational skill training. Um, but it's not enough. The fact of the matter is we're talking about investing another $2 billion in, in expanding prisons. Um, that's not helping us, right? It's, it's too many of our problems are not being addressed. And what we are addressing are the symptoms. We'll never resolve the problems if we continue to address just symptoms alone. So we have to get to the heart of this. When you look at nonviolent offenders, um, most of them are drug-related incidents. Now that's a young person that gets caught in possession of, of uh, drugs or selling drugs. The rest of their life, they might as well be stamped with the scarlet letter. Because the fact of the matter is they go in, they serve their time. Our system is meant to be structured in such a way that that was your punishment. But the fact of the matter is, the punishment continues long after you leave. In fact, you walk out, even with your vocational training, you walk out of that prison. The moment you hit the sidewalk, you're likely to have no bank account, no job, no housing. You no longer qualify for subsidi subsidized housing. You have no job prospect. What do you have? You have no hope. Right? So we have to make sure that we are building different programs so that uh, when somebody leaves uh, our correctional institutions, that they have a job lined up, uh, one they can carry with them, and doesn't take it away from the guy who might be filling their place. So, I, in fact, I've, I've started doing some research, not that, not that this is the, necessarily the, the answer to this solution, but I was talking to Sheriff Tompkins about some of the programs that, for instance, Amazon has, where people can bid for work online. And if you do that, the person who, now there's obviously a lot of technical issues and access to the internet and, and things like that that would have to be overcome. But the, the concept is simple, that it's creating a job while you're in, uh, incarcerated, and it's a job that you continue as soon as you are out and free again. Uh, and by the way, it's something that the next person can still do. It doesn't take that job away from them. So that's, I think, one of the things we need to be thinking about. Now, by the way, 48% um, 48 of people who do leave come right back within six months. Six months. Why? Because when they walk out, there's only one thing they do know. And it's the one thing they can walk back into, right? So it gets them right back into jail. And by the way, we're spending over $40,000 a year to keep them there. I'd rather invest in the person, give them an opportunity so that they can, in fact, become productive members of society, that we don't have to expand our prisons. I'd love to see us reducing our prisons and investing that money in other things like education. I mean, this is not a new idea. When I was in high school, um, our high school had a small community police station right, right at the front door. Um, it wasn't there as an authoritative figure. It was there um, as part of the ecosystem. Um, we would get to see these officers on a daily basis. You knew them first name. You played basketball with them uh, after school. I mean, they were friends. And I think one of the things that, that I can say about my experience there is that I never saw a police officer, therefore, as someone that I, I couldn't trust or, or was afraid of or, or whatnot. It was somebody that I saw as a, a friend and, and protector. Um, and I think it's like any, anybody else in life. Um, if, if you have one positive relationship, that you can uh, project onto others. If you have a negative relationship, you project that onto others. Um, so I think but what we have to do is create the positive interactions um, and look at opportunities to, for our police officers, our firefighters, anybody in uniform, uh, to work with our kids, uh, to be there, to be part of their lives in, in positive ways um, so that they can build those relationships and that trust that, that can exist between them. Well, affordable housing is an issue that I've worked on for a long time. As was mentioned in my introduction, I worked at United Way uh, where I focused on ending 
family homelessness. I then went to Northeastern University where I worked with um, the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy. We do the housing report card. Uh, affordable housing is a huge issue in Massachusetts. Um, so the short answer to your question is yes. Um, I think I, I do want to put one caveat to um, the, the consolidation of housing authorities. Uh, although I think that there is opportunities, and it's a one way to allow our communities to think a little bit broader and beyond our own um, uh, borders, we'll say. Um, I do think we also have to, to do it in ways that maintain local control. Uh, and we can do that. Uh, so there is opportunities for both. Um, but in the end, what we need to be doing is creating communities that people can live in, that they can afford. The fact of the matter is, more than 4,100 families tonight do not have a home to call their own. There's more than 20,000 children a year in Massachusetts. We are one of the wealthiest states in the, na in the nation, and one the wealthiest nation on the planet, and that to me is unconscionable, especially given the fact that 29% of those families have a working adult. Now think about that. You work 40 hours a week, you still can't afford a roof over your head or three meals on the, on the table each day for your children. There's something broken about that and it starts, and what, what I believe in is the housing first model. That we have to get people into safe, sustainable housing. Then we can um, provide additional services should they need them. But part of that is also worrying about children. You know, a single mother, we want her to be able to work, but if you have a, a three-year-old at home, what do you do? How do you, how do you get your education? How do you do, go on job interviews? How do you find that job? How do you keep that job once you have it? If you have to worry about where your child is uh, after, uh, for, if they're only three years old. So we have to also invest in um, child care. So I, I think that it's, there's a lot of things we can invest in, but affordable housing, to me, is one of the fundamental issues that we have in Massachusetts. Well, j just to, to clarify, I, I, I am in support of consolidation. I was just saying that as part of consolidation, we also have to think about maintaining local control so that people who are in the community, community and know best what fits in the community or what's best for the community um, still have that input. So... I mean, I, I agree with everything you said, is what I'm saying. You know. Control over what? Control over what? Mm -hmm. the, the housing list is, is a statewide waiting list. Mm -hmm. Most of the second meeting is for. What kind of control would you like to give the, the local community? Well, I think, I mean, as you know, specific choices to, to every community in terms of locations and things like that is uh, is. The, the one areas where I think each neighborhood has its, uh, or community has its um, say, or should have its say, um, <clears throat> I think where we can really consolidate, as you said, and save is on the administrative side. And that's whether it be the application process and things like that, we can easily um, consolidate on a more regional basis. Um, but the, the direct impact on community, I, I do think that there should be some local control left. Yeah, I think perhaps, uh, I'll be honest with you, I haven't thought specifically about this issue, but you bring up a great point. Um, I think there have to be some uh, regulation as to what businesses, um, because you have to keep in mind the impact of neighbors and things like that. Um, but there's probably plenty of opportunities, uh, as you said, you know, Microsoft got started in a garage. Uh, so there are plenty of business opportunities um, that it's not disturbing to a neighborhood. Um, uh, and, you know, if it was a, it involved heavy manufacturing, that might be a different story. Um, so I think there's opportunity there. I think you, you make a great point. Um, but I think it, it's not just open it up for just about anything. You have to be a little bit protection uh, for, for neighbors. Um, I know this is going to sound like a political answer, but yes and no. Um, I, I supported certainly the investment side of, of the governor's uh, plan. I think there were certain things I would have done slightly differently, for instance. Um, I do have issue or have concern um, connecting the gas tax to transportation as, at least in, in my hopes, that uh, our gas consumption will go down. Um, so what you're really talking about is also reducing, simultaneously reducing our investment in Let transportation. Let me ask this follow-up, which hopefully you can answer quickly. 
would you support a plan that would increase the income tax level while simultaneously increasing the personal exemption and lowering yes. the sales tax? <laughs> that part is easy. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you. Thank you.